Welcome to the Avail Podcast, where we dig deep and talk about the art of leadership. My name is Virgil Sierra, and today, once again, we're diving back into our Avail archives. This is week two of our Back to Leadership series, a series revisiting our highly requested and critically acclaimed Avail episodes that we feel all leaders would benefit from taking another listen to. So get ready as we revisit our Avail podcast episode with Charles Jenkins on staying effective amidst the transitions life brings. So without further ado, let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Avail Leadership Podcast. My name is Virgil Sierra. I'm the Avail Media host. I'm also the lead pastor of Vertical Church, aka Iglesia Vertical here in South Florida, where we are one church, two languages. And this is one thing that I can say without a shadow of doubt. Avail Leadership Podcast never disappoints never disappoints. We are privileged and honored today to be sitting down in an amazing leadership conversation with none other than Charles Jenkins, Pastor Charles Jenkins. And and here's the thing. Some of you might know him from the ministry side of things. Some of you might know him from the music side of things. Some of you might know him from the leadership and uh, business side of things. Uh, Charles, it is an honor to spend this time with you as part of the Avail Leadership team. How are you feeling today? It's an honor to be with you. Thank you for having me. I am super califragilistic, ex-realidocious. I'm fantastic. <laughs> I love it. My kids would be happy, especially my daughter, because she loves Mary Poppins. Hey, um, this is a great opportunity, Charles, to just connect with you. Um, we know that you are a leader of leaders, and we know and believe that God has put a, a message in your heart, and he's given you a voice, and he's given you influence. And so we are honored to have you with us. Uh, and as we jump in, uh, before we kind of get into the leadership talk, which is the big part of what we do here at Avail Leadership, um, I, I'd love for people to get to know you a little bit. I know there's a lot of people who know who you are, but there's a few a few guys and gals out there who are just getting to know who you are. Why don't you give us a little summary of your story? Kind of, kind of, what was your journey to get to where you are today? No, so um, it's a huge honor. I would say, in a nutshell, uh, I was born and raised in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, and so uh, uh, I'm a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. And uh, <laughs> among, I got multiple teams because I've lived in multiple places. Um, amazing household, two parents. Uh, my father passed away when I was nine, and so. My mom, a school teacher, my father had a construction company, landscaping company, uh, but my mom raised my brother and I. I've got one biological brother. And so, you know, when my father passed away, you know, I found myself as a young man trying to figure out uh, how to be a man. What does a man look like? Mm. And uh, chose some of the wrong roads, uh, maybe some of the wrong places, the wrong things, but I had a tough mother. And, uh, you know, fast forward, a big part of my story was uh, uh, to get me on track. Uh, I had skipped a lot. I was skipping school and missing classes. And so I, I, intervention was done. My punishment uh, was to have a hall monitor to make sure I didn't miss school and to put me in gospel choir after school so I couldn't <laughs> go hang out. It was, it was the, I, I hated it. I didn't think it was for strong young men. And I just was, I would sit there with my arms folded. I'd taken seven years of classical piano as a child. And um, one day the piano player walked in as I had been sitting there with my face frowned up, arms folded, never participating. He started playing the piano and never looked at the keys. That captivated me and even though I had been baptized, I think out of that moment, uh, it led to me singing, hearing the words, and it warmed my heart up to what it meant to serve Christ and serve people. And, um, you know, I would sum my life up in, you know, ministry, um, community work, and the arts, music, uh. Uh, film. I, I would sum my story up, but that's, that's kind of the short version. <laughs> well, I like it. We got a, we got a bunch of things in common, specifically in music uh, and in ministry, because uh, that's something that's a big part of my life has been as well. 
uh, uh, we talked a little bit about that when we when we got got to know each other. But yeah. but I love this. I love this, Charles, because you are a uh, in your journey. You were you were a young man who's who's just um, not really maybe close to God, not really clear. But there's this moment yeah. where God has your attention, and it's kind of like a defining moment. And one of the things that the Lord has used to shape you along this journey is the arts. I love that. I love that. I think sometimes we underestimate what what God can do with even things like that, even even like a mu- music, you know, uh, uh, creativity, right? And uh, fast forward to uh, just be- becoming eventually pastor. You became a lead pastor for your church, correct? Yeah. So so the amazing thing from from that moment in that high school gospel choir developed a relationship with Jesus. I started preaching the gospel when I was 16. I was ordained and being offered churches at 18. Hmm. I don't know what these beautiful people were thinking about. (laughs) And at 21, I was named the successor uh, to probably the most historic church in the city of Chicago, a church called Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. We affectionately call it Fellowship Chicago. An iconic man of God, uh, Reverend Clay Evans, who served 50 years Fellowship was Grand Central Station for all things community. Um, Reverend Evans had a a close relationship with uh, Jesse Jackson, who he licensed and ordained. And through Jesse, Dr. King ended up coming to speak at Fellowship. And quick story, um, we were building a new church uh, in the 60s. And the mayor at the time, Mayor Daley, Uh, he called Reverend Evans and said, if you let King come speak, I'll stop the construction on your church. Reverend Evans says, it's not your church. It's not my church. It's God's church. It will be built with or without you. (laughs) King came and spoke. And the next day, uh, the bank reneged on the loan. The tractors pulled off the lot and the steel frame stood for seven years. And so that steel frame through seven Chicago winners, it became a symbol of righteousness, justice and equality. And people like Sidney Portier and Harry Belafonte and Mahalia Jackson would sing at Fellowship every Sunday night, uh, Aretha Franklin and tons. It became this center for hope, but also sacrifice and conviction and an opportunity. So that was the place that I was named the new guy at 21. So everybody <laughs> thought my predecessor was senile. They thought he had con- contracted dementia. They thought <laughs> that he had lost his mind. Who is this kid? And uh, it was very wild because, you know, the, the church was 75 to 80 percent, 75 or older. So everybody, wow. my grandmother and grandfather, this historic place that spoke to our communities at every level, um, holistically, education, um, a business, uh, just all across the board. It was Grand Central Stations where all of the big meetings were hosted um, with, with uh, government and community and so on and so forth. And so I took over. I had a three year apprenticeship with um, Pastor Evans and. Uh, I took over at 24 and uh, it was a, it was, it was a journey I cannot describe. (laughs) Okay. So I like this again, we're under the veil leadership process. This is leadership, leadership, leadership. So here's, here's where you find yourself 21. This big transition is announced. Yeah. And then it's about a three year process of apprentice being an apprentice there, kind of getting the, uh, the understanding the ins and outs. So you're the young man, you're the young pastor, you're the young leader coming in, right? Yes. yes. And, and that, that's what happened when you kind of came in, in that, that which, which I'm sure had its challenges, you know, coming into a culture and an organization that, that has existed for so many years pr- prior to you being there, uh, having, having uh, you know, the average age being so much higher than your age as the, you know, incoming successor. I'm sure that carried, carried a lot of... Uh, challenges. Would that be true? Well, it's beyond true (laughs) Uh, on so many levels um, because, first of all, people have already determined what you can't do, what you can't be, what you want to accomplish. And so that those are steep hills to climb. Um, And then 
you know, honestly speaking, having the ability to hear and even feel naysayers while you simultaneously focus on your obligations and responsibilities takes a different kind of courage uh, that I didn't even know I needed at that time. But as I look back, I'm like, wow, when you, it's like shooting at the free throw line and everybody's booing you. (laughs) Um, and, And then, you know, as you said, it was its own culture, an iconic historic culture, um, a template blueprint for churches all across the country. And so that there was tradition um, that there, there were, you know, so many things that were set in stone that you weren't to touch. There were expectations um, there. There were also there was also ownership and onus of an identity that people did not want to change from a culture standpoint. And then also there was an expectation that I emulate and imitate my success. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for me, from a leadership standpoint, there was a need to um, embrace humility at the highest levels, um, to not wear my feelings on my shoulder, to not be easily offended, to be a student, to learn the culture, to learn the people, to learn the environment, to learn the way things were done, to sit with people and to understand the importance of uh, honoring relationships and valuing who people were more than what they did. Um, and, And actually seeing people, loving people. And then the psychology of understanding how people think, how people process, how people react Mm -hmm. to decisions, change, opportunities, possibilities. And so, you know, um, as you talk about challenges, it called for, you know, being strategic, being thoughtful and intentional and planning well any decision Uh, planning well conversations, uh, identifying and leveraging uh, stakeholders and allowing, knowing when to be public in making moves and knowing when to make those moves through other people, Um, having enough security to not need credit or to look for any recognition, but having a commitment to accomplishing goals uh, and getting things done for God, God's people, for the community or what have you with, you know, a spirit of strategic intentionality and lifting people up as a part of those processes. It's very complex, very technical, very, but in that's leadership in anywhere, <laughs> USA, anywhere around the world. <laughs> yeah. That's good. You know, you know, as I'm listening to you, uh, you know, our situation, again, a lot of similarities, different in, in, in respect to the level of the church. I took over for the, for the church my father planted uh, yeah. and I took over, you know, 20, 20 and change years after, after it was planted. But as you're talking, I'm just remembering, I remember what, what me and my wife together kind of walked through in that season of stepping in and, and having a lot of eyes watching and kind of, you know, arms folded, kind of asking the question, let's see what's going to happen here with some of these adjustments and changes that are coming, you know, or that are happening or, you know, let's see if, let's see if we're going to be okay with this and feeling like you're pushing by yourself in in a certain season because other people don't get it yet or they, or they haven't approved yet or they don't know if it's okay. So, so, so that's, so that's that, that's that. And so fast forward, fast forward some years ahead. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Again, I said this earlier, early, early on, um, you're a young man and by no means uh, was anybody maybe expecting for you when you transitioned. In other words, when you passed on the torch to another. So now you're on the other side. First, you're talking about at an early age in your early 20s, receiving that torch or receiving that baton and, and running, having the responsibility to help transition a church, transition an organization yeah. And then running and running hard, I'm sure. And then all of a sudden, fast forward, which is where you are now, and and recently when you passed on that torch to a, to a successor, now now you weren't the one receiving. Now you were the one 
handing over, passing, passing on. And I know that your up and coming book, which we're going to get to in a little bit, Seasons, How to Grow and Succeed During Times of Transition is, is probably uh, kind of a front row seat to this. Yeah. But, but fill us in on, on that, which, which happened pretty recently, correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, north of a year ago. Um, I officially retired after altogether 23 years of service and fellowship. And, you know, as I mentioned the word service, as I as I back up and come forward, you know, in my mind, service is the centerpiece of significance. And I think as I develop those relationships and build the credibility to pass the baton to mm-hmm. someone without a church vote and without um, some of the church bureaucracy that happens in some churches. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, safety in a multitude of counsel and all that. But, you know, as I served through the place over the course of 23 years and served in the city and and had the honor of helping to lead multiple massive projects in the city, like getting Walmart to Chicago and uh, Target and um, a ride share, major ride share company, um, <laughs> might be Uber, um, and, and tons of other things that created hundreds of millions of dollars to the city's bottom line and tens of thousands of jobs and tons of other stuff that in my mind is ministry too, um, because as people would join fellowship, um, many people join jobless. Many people would join in need of so many um, social services. And so mm-hmm. for me, it was to disciple people biblically, but to also look at how to serve the sheep in a holistic way. And after 23 years of of, of so many people coming to Jesus and so much good work and, and surviving, <laughs> <laughs> surviving, um, God had placed it on my heart maybe maybe three years prior to my announcement, um, I just kind of felt some discomfort. Let me let me say it that way. I felt some discomfort. There was nothing wrong. Um, of course, the world was changing. Millennials were now present. Um, <laughs> everything was moving digitally. Um, people were, uh, as, a, as a dear friend of mine, everybody's attendance was being affected at some level. And as a dear friend of mine said, it, it's not that people have left the church, it's that they've changed seats. We mm-hmm. saw streaming numbers going through the roof, um, and, and, but we were solid. And, but I felt some discomfort. And on the backdrop of a massive project that I was leading uh, that did not end the way I wanted, wanted it to go, we were, we were doing a a $50 million community development project through our non-religious nonprofit. Um, there was a big need for quality education. 52 schools have been closed in our city. And so I felt like there was a need to mm. put high quality education into our underserved, under-resourced neighborhood. And long story short, um, our, our city, uh, there was this big fight against charter schools. And the school that we were partnering with was one of the leading charter schools in our city. So the politics and the bureaucracy wouldn't allow the first phase of our project to happen. Um, The Green family, um, they own Hobby Lobby stores. They were so kind to purchase a massive building and donate it to us. And so we're in this process. Long story short, politics don't let it happen. I get in touch with the Green family. I get their permission to sell the building. We sell the building and a developer in town, a leading developer heard about our vision, bought the building, loved our vision so much. He implemented the vision, the school that we were bringing. He eventually got them in six, 700 students, STEM, STEAM school. Mission is still accomplished. Not like I planned, but it's accomplished. On the backdrop of that, I think I was depressed though. Um, And that's a big word. I know I was really down and I just started raising questions about what else am I supposed to do? 23 years, Thousands of people have been saved, discipled, tons of programming on the ground in the community, feeding the hungry, ex-offender programming, youth programming, after school care, just tons of stuff. I'm asking God all over and over again, you know, 
am I doing more what I'm doing in this role? Um, or is there something else? And I kind of ask that question. In my new book, Seasons, I talk about recognizing red lights, green lights, and yellow lights in your life. And most people think, as I came to my epiphany, maybe, as I mentioned, three years later, this green light, uh, I mean, this, this, this stoplight, the journey to work through passing the baton started with a yellow light. Slow down, contemplate, process, think. And the conclusion, even when I got to making the decision to pass the baton, and this is for any leader, whether you're a senior pastor or you're in a ministry role, you want to lead well, but you want to leave well. You don't want to understay, but you don't want to overstay. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we set we set patterns for tenure, you know, sometimes that, you know, exceed what God might have in mind or exceed might, what might be for the person's uh, timeline as the whole concept of seasons is all of our lives are framed in scenes and segments of time. And it's important to know what season you're in so you know what you are doing and what you're not doing. And so as I found that finish line, which I learned from a number of people in ministry, that's a phenomenon. Oh my God, there's a finish line (laughs) for roles. For roles, there are finish lines. And, And for some people, that's death. Um, but for other people, that's not. It could be why you're still able to run. And and for me, as I found my finish line, I was in a prayerful moment, probably in May of 2018. And I was just kind of meditating, thinking and, and prayerfully, um, which means for me, I was welcoming God's input as I was just kind of so Lord, so, and God placed on my heart these thoughts. Um, you completed your assignment. Your role was to transition the church from where it was to where it is today, mission accomplished. And I had this image and picture of, you know, Moses and, and his time, um, Joshua and his time and even Jesus and his time on earth. And in that assignment, the uh, completing assignments. And man, I got a piece that I could not describe when I reached that moment. Those three years though were complex because, you know, I I, I had a dear friend say, were you burnt out? Or you think you're burnt out? I, I, I would be, I would, I would be rested, but the energy that I would once have for the things that I would look to, I would look forward to the fight. I would look forward to certain meetings. I would look forward to charts and graphs. And I would look forward to, to vision casting and, and presentations and rallying people. And my enthusiasm shifted. I still had energy, but it was, how can I touch the culture with the arts? How can I use music? How can I to drive people to the local church? How could I use film? How could I use television? How could I use fashion? And music taught me that, you know, there are people who might not ever hear our sermons or there are people that might might not ever come into our churches, but they will welcome us into their homes through a song, uh, to their gym, in their car. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, gospel music or um, contemporary Christian music, um, the, the song is a three-minute sermon put to <laughs> melody with music. And, mm-hmm. and I think more churches should see it not as competition, uh, but as a tool and a resource to reach people, touch people, impact people, and then guide people to the ongoing services that lead people to, to walk with God. That's good. You know, I, I love hearing the story. And I think as leaders, it's important to hear stories because we're all living out our stories. And, and, and I recently heard it said that every decision you make um, 
is part of the story you're writing, right? And so the the, the decisions we're making today is it's going to determine the stories we tell tomorrow. And so here we are today. You're telling your story of kind of this whole process. Uh, first, at the be- at the beginning of the story, you know, over twenty something years ago, you're coming in, yeah, and you and you're tr- you're coming in. You you are the successor, and you are leaning into a predecessor, and you are taking an organization, uh, receiving it, and helping to help it grow. Transition. Fast forward twenty something years later, now you are the predecessor, passing on to a successor. Yeah. Uh, again, another season of transition. Understanding maybe, hey, this is a season where God is calling me in this way. Same God, same calling, just a new way of, 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 uh, of, being, of how it's happening, of, of what your focus is. And, and so in comes this book, this new book that you have coming out, Seasons, How to Grow and Succeed During Times of Transition. And you mentioned to me about four big ideas regarding transitioning a church or transitioning an organization. And, and I, wanna, I wanna delve into those because I think a lot of leaders can use this, whether it's the leader who's been there for, for, for many, many years, maybe even decades, and is, and is preparing maybe to hand off, whether it's a younger leader who's coming in, who's been disciples, who's been getting prepped up for that transition, uh, you know, what, what it is to get out, come in, what it is to go out, what is the process. Can you talk to us about these four? I think the first one you mentioned is is when a person is transitioning to a church, what should they be thinking? You want to start off there? So if, if, if you will allow me, I want to, I want to contextualize what we're about to get into it. And, and if I could take a second and tell you why I wrote the book. Yes, yes, yes. Um, do it. Because um, when I announced that I was, I was, I was retiring in my early forties, um, my phone rang off the hook and it was, leading leaders in faith, business, community, just all around the the world. And I wrote the book because um, people were saying, why? Things are going well. And when I said my season was up, nobody could get their head around that. Like, it was like, no, you're just getting started. Like, no. And when I explained the idea of seasons, all of our lives are framed and fashioned in segments of time. You got to know what season of life you're in. So you know what you are doing, what you're not doing. And you have got to make sure you have all of the tools to be successful in that season. And I list in the book, you know, you could be in a planting season, you're just starting or a harvesting season or a running season, or I go through all these seasons to help people clearly define where you are. But once I explained that, people were like, um, you got to unpack that. Like what that <laughs> actually, how do you even hear that you're supposed to leave? So I got a chapter on how to hear from God. What are you doing next? I've been preaching my whole life. Like, how are you going to discover that? So I got a section on purpose. And these four areas that, that you talk about um, or, or want me to talk about, Um, are at the center as I go through basic things that we all need every single day as believers to to just refresh ourselves with. Um, But simultaneously, you know, when we talk about transition, um, we're, we're talking about making adjustments. We're talking about changes. We're talking about, and I think that, you know, when I came into fellowship, as some as as I mentioned, as I transitioned in as a leader, as somebody's transitioning into a role, I think I think it's so important to have almost a tourist slash exploratory <laughs> demeanor, disposition, or attitude. I'm just here to learn. I'm I'm looking around. <laughs> Fill me in. Yeah, you know, it's, it's I'm not coming to be somebody. I'm not a threat. Uh, I'm I'm not, you know, uh, coming in with a baseball bat to bash all of your ideas or all of your golden calves. And <laughs> <laughs> I am a friend and I am here to serve, but I'm coming as a learner. And I think coming as a learner um, when you're transitioning into a role. 
doesn't mean that you're a leader. It does mean that you're a servant leader coming in to dislodge and disengage bombs. People mm-hmm. are on edge. There is uh, un- unforeseen anxiety. People have already determined in their minds what they think you're going to do. <laughs> and tensions are high. It's like he's going to, she's going to. And so I think when you're transitioning into an organization, I think that in my humble opinion, it's important to come in, you know, pulling out those wires of tension and and being relational and establishing yourself as somebody who cares. Because as you know, the old adage says, people do not care about how much you know until they know how much you how care. Much you care. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. so good. That's so good. I, I think the way that you have framed it is perfect because I think that I think that a lot of people do have a hard time with this idea of seasons. People get stuck and attached to a title, to a role, to a position, whether it's insecurity because I don't know what I would do if I don't do this, whether it's fear of the of the unknown, whether it's what they've always seen, you know, and they haven't seen anything otherwise. Um, but but I, I love the perspective of when I come in, if I'm the person that's stepping into this new role, uh, the way that I'm perceived is important, right? I, I don't want people to perceive me as, the man, like you said, with the man with a bat that's here to crush and bash everything we've ever done. Um, having an, an attitude of, of, a, of a learner, of a, hey, I'm here. I love that because that that now sets the tone for what everybody maybe wasn't expecting. They were expecting that new person to come in and be maybe abrasive and maybe not be, you know, but when they see, oh, wait, there's, there's a, they're seeking to understand. They're seeking to, to, to come in. This is great. Okay. So, so you talked a little bit about specifically when a person's transitioning to a church, right? What would you say is the next one? I would say, I would say the next one um, that, that I worked through is, is what it looks like to actually transition an organization. Uh Uh-huh. Um, I think as you come in as as a learner, I think that now you 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 are a surgeon of sorts, you know. And we all we 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 be either seen shows or some are surgeons who are listening, but the methodical, thoughtful, um, um. Timely, and when I say timely, very thoughtful about the timing with how you move, where you move, what you do, um, considering the collateral damage. If you do this, make this decision, um, and 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 thinking through from a planning uh, perspective, but also considering the power of safety that comes from advisory and um, a a coach of sorts. Um, Dr. Samuel Chan was mine um, from before I took over fellowship. Um, I was a baby. I was 21. And, And so having somebody in your ear and then having a personal board of directors to help you process the moves you make and the decisions that you embrace and engage. And I think for me, as I consider my path and my pattern, because I was young, you know, our first year, a thousand people joined, then another thousand, then maybe for 15 years. And it was quiet. And I would say to people, I need a lot of help. I have no idea. Uh, and, and people would say to me, you know, you, you're surrounded by a bunch of people with gray hair on your team. And I said, yeah, uh, because I don't have any and I have everything to gain and everything to lose all at the same time. And so I think for any and we see this, um, any one of us, we're only as good as the team around us. And I I think having the right team around us um, and being very considerate of people um, as we consider processes. I, I would, I would, I would have coffee with people and people who, some who had the worst attitudes in the world, um, but 
you know, finding the inner strength uh, that God can give us to be able to sit with people who are adversaries and loving them until they become allies, Mm -hmm. Uh, knowing what to tolerate, knowing what to eliminate, knowing what to amputate, uh, all of those kinds of things from a structure, strategy, over communicating when you can. Sometimes people can't handle everything, uh, everything they want to know, they can't handle it. Mm -hmm. And so knowing the wisdom around uh, information uh, that uh, will help the process and help people get and gain the vision, all of that around from a transitioning and organization standpoint. Uh, In my last book, Thriving and Change, uh, I live on transition, transitioning. It's all about transitioning an organization, 150%. But I touch on it in the season's book. Very good. Very good. All right. So you talked a little bit about what a person should be considering when transitioning to a church. Yeah. Then a little bit about when a, when a person is in, in transition yeah. of the organization, you know, or the church. Now let's talk about that. This third one, which is if a person is transitioning out of an organization, out of a church, out of that lead role, what should they be thinking about and considering? So I think a handful of things. I think, first of all, um, being very prayerful with um, a personal board of directors um, that can help you process is critical. Because I had I, I was processing alone my time. Is my time up? Um, am I coming to a finish line? And I think it's different scenarios for different people. Um, But when I started to raise those questions, I had some people I could bounce those questions off of who I could trust that would be honest and objective from their perspective. And they were also prayerful people. So I think if if you're considering a finish line, not just in a church, but anywhere, um, as I've had people from all sectors of life say that they left jobs, changed careers, changed cities on the backdrop of my announcement. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you do will affect so many people. And so you must be effective in your decision. And so I think, you know, if I was sitting across the table talking to somebody, it would be, you know, first, you got to be very prayerful. Second, you've got to make sure you've got a multitude of counsel. And then third, um, there might be two groups of people. It might be a person who has a finish line in view, but they've got some more runway. So what do you want to accomplish for the runway that you have left? Um, Mm -hmm. That's one. And then, you know, write the vision, make it plain, make sure those things are clear and get after those things that you want to make sure you, those hurdles you want to jump before you cross the finish line. The last thing that I will say, and this is the process, and um, I'll say again, Dr. Chan was with me when I started and when I ended, and he is still a part of Fellowship's family, um, is um, a handful of things we did, and different people do it differently. Um, Once I found my finish line and I knew that I only had a year, year and a half left or something like that, I wanted to do a handful of things. I wanted to have a hand in identifying the successor because I did not want to leave. I I knew that me announcing I was leaving, young, not sick, no problems, no issues, there was going to be this gigantic for what? Why? Mm -hmm. And it was going to be jolting. So I wanted to be helpful in, in making a decision around who was going to be coming next because I knew the impact of my announcement was going to, for, for some people, it was going, going it was overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I didn't want to just say bye. And there's some people who do that. There are different churches that have different structures. But for the context I was in, um, I wanted to identify successor. I was prayerful thoughtful. God led me to the right person. I brought him to my board and my team. 
everybody agreed, approved, welcomed him. Um, my successor, Clay Evans, got a chance to meet him before he passed away, spent 18 months with him. He loved him. Um, and so that's one, identifying a successor, um, which I go through it adeptly in the book, but it, I can't overemphasize the God factor in because when God first put it on my heart to find a successor. I was like, where? <laughs> the world is so big. Um, and, and God guided that process. The other thing is an organizational audit. And as I passed the baton, you know, like, like selling a home, I wanted to f- fix everything I could possibly fix um, as much as possible. I didn't fix everything, but I wanted to hand it off um, in a manner that that would allow him to come in and run and not be at a position where he's trying to figure out how to make big changes without gaining the credibility um, with people not knowing who he was yet. So I wanted to uh, uh, add as much value. So we did an organizational audit. Again, I brought in Dr. Chan and we looked at what's right. What's wrong? What's broken? What needs to be fixed? What needs attention? Mm. What doesn't need attention? Um, we sat down. Um, he sat down. Dr. Chan sat down with all of my staff uh, and then some key leaders, interviewed them. And we identified, you know, elephants that I didn't know were elephants. Uh, things mm. like communication among the team and uh, I had one uh, group on one floor, another group on another floor. There was a disconnect communicatively and tons of other, not tons, but a few other big things that uh, I tackled. Um, and then there was a robust succession plan. Um, how do we how do we roll out the announcement? Um, what does the communication plan look like? Uh, what does the strategy around bringing uh, my successor in? What does it look like um, for me to exit? Um, what does it look like for our, our staff and leaders? And, and we did a PR plan um, because, you know, I felt like I, I didn't want the, uh, I'll say it this way. I saw it as an opportunity to say to our community, um, something good is happening and we'd love for you to be a part of it. Uh, I, I saw it as good news that could garner people's attention and maybe they would come visit the church, which many people did. We had 700 people join in 2020. And so we made a lot of noise also to say, hey, here's a transition model for maybe some there's some pastors and leaders that are looking to transition successors in, predecessors out. Here's a possible model that might not be the exact template, but maybe you can be inspired in some ways to consider how you do what you do. Love it. I think you're right. I think that the journey that that you the journey and the chapters and the seasons that you've been through, um, even because even at maybe younger than most people when they go through those seasons and chapters of their journeys, it gives you an opportunity to speak into so much of, uh, of these transitions could, because you can speak to the, to the successor, you can speak to the predecessor, you can speak to the people around you have just a key, you have a key perspective that not everybody has. And that's so valuable. Uh, Charles, that's so valuable. Let, let's close off with, with the last, uh, one of these that you had mentioned to me, you know, uh, to a church, transition to church, transitioning out of a church or an organization, and then you, you mentioned reinvention. Can, can you, I guess, wrap it up with this aspect of what, what is reinvention? What's the idea of reinventing yourself? And after that, I want to make sure people know how to find you, how to get in touch with you, you know, online with what's going on with the book and all that. We'll talk a little bit about the Avail Journal, which I know you, you, you've appreciated. Um, reinvention, what is, what is that all about? You know, I think for any one of us, um, the thing about seasons is, you know, We all have different kinds of seasons in every area of our lives. We're single, we're married, we're parents, we're grandparents, we're not aunties, we are, we are in a job, we're not, we're in a role, we're not. 
And and for whatever place or point of life that it, it, that that is for us, it brings us to a place or to a point quite often where either God and or the moment is calling for us to turn into something else Hmm. or to become something else um, or to do something else that mandates us to have a mindset that enables us to be most effective and successful. So so the whole concept around reinvention is, is the idea of inventing again. You know, when I left this role at fellowship, it did not hit me when I made the announcement. Um, and when I look back, um, it did not hit me while I was leading the process for 18 months. Uh, it did not hit me um, when I stood before the church on my last Sunday. It hit me uh, on New Year's Eve at the end of the year of 2019 uh, when I was sitting in a church uh, that um, for the first time in 23 years, I'm in someone else's church. I am no longer the pastor. It's like the person if they lose a loved one. Some people grieve before. Some people grieve when the person passes. And then some people doesn't hit them until everything is over. Mm -hmm. And so I think emotionally, psychologically, when you have done a thing for so long, you have been in a place for so long, not only have you been a part of it, but it becomes a part of you (laughs) innately. There are regiments, there are drills, there are things that are clockwork, staff meetings, emails, phone calls. And it occurred to me, and even to some of my staff, you know, New Year's Eve, when I called back to say Happy New Year, some of them called me and said, you know, we'll send you the report on Tuesday. Automatic. You don't have to send me the report anymore. I'm not the guy anymore. Send it to, the, to my new guy. Send it to our new pastor. So, so. Um, when I talk about reinvention, you know, uh, and I, I, when the book drops, I'm also there are going to be classes because I want to help talk people through this. It's also the emotional and psychological transition that you got to make mm-hmm. because sometimes your life is at a location that your mind and your 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 mind hasn't caught up yet. And Mm -hmm. so it's literally, you know, being able to have the ability to invent yourself again, to become something else and to embrace God's new plan for your life that sometimes you don't even know is in you. You're like Jeremiah. So you want me to be a prophet and what? I'm too young. I have no experience. Moses. So you want me to lead the people? And uh, have you seen my track record and my resume? And have you checked out my speaking ability lately? And so, so it sounds so easy. Reinvent yourself. But I walk through, you know, um, strategic thoughtful concepts around what it takes to say, uh, I must become something, uh, A, I never thought I could, B, I didn't know I would, or C, I anticipated I would be this or do this, but how do I fully engulf and ingratiate myself into this role that God has brought me to in this particular season of my life. Unbelievable. Hey, this has been such a such an intriguing conversation again because a lot of times Charles, I can talk to the guy who passed it on. I can talk to the guy who received it <laughs> or the guy who's in the middle of it. Yeah. But talking to you today, I'm talking to the guy who's been kind of in all in all <laughs> of the angles around it. So do you, you know, see the band-aids? <laughs> do you see the, the slangs? And the <laughs> you don't need to. You don't need to tell me about them or show them. I know they're there. I, 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 if you take off that, but I watch. If anybody watch the video? If you take off that that red beanie right now, I, I will see the scars. I know. I know. Uh, and that makes you a valuable leader and a valuable voice to the church, to the communities. And, and, and a relevant voice for all of us in these days. So I, that is so awesome. How can people find you online? How can they get the book or connect with you on social media? CharlesJenkins.com. CharlesJenkins.com. The book is available at CharlesJenkins.com. Uh, and uh, 
I'm, 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 my hands are full signing books, <laughs> but charlesjenkins.com. Um, uh, my Instagram is Charles Jenkins on Instagram. And, and, and I'll mention really fast as I'm reinventing myself. I am now a fashion designer. I'm in the film space. Um, nice. and, uh, I've got a brand called positive air that, um, will be available later, later this year that's being designed in Paris. And so, um, yeah, Charles Jenkins. Love it. Love it. Hey, make sure, make sure you all connect and make sure you look for the book Seasons coming out soon in 2021. Hey, I got an Avail Journal here. Charles, I know you're aware of the Avail Journal. Love Dr. It. Sam, Chan, Martin, and the Avail team are, are doing such an excellent job. Um, do you want to share a few words about the Avail Journal? Have you, have you felt one? Have you seen one? Have you heard it? Well, I felt it. I've seen it. And I think I'm in it. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, you know, when I first got one, I'll be honest, um, it is not just a resource, um, but it, it's, uh, let's see what my wife calls it. Uh, it's a coffee table book. Um, uh-huh. it's beautiful. It's beautifully done. It's filled with wisdom and insight and direction and, um, and, and, empowerment wow look at that there he is there it is wow wow there it is i love it i'm so honored thank <laughs> you for putting me on program so you know but but it's beautifully done and the quality you know we've all seen magazines i think that's why i think it's so smart that this is called a journal yeah um because of the content but the quality of the document, and it's something that you want to have out in your home or in your office that can also be a conversation piece and lead people to to be able to grow and learn. And so I recommend it for everybody. I'm recommending it to my friends and yeah. it's special. Yeah, it is. It is. And in the most recent edition, uh, January 2021, Charles Jenkins uh, article entitled Know Your Season. The when may be more important than the what. That's the available journal. By the way, everybody, if you have not yet claimed your free annual subscription, yes, if you haven't done so, you can claim a free annual subscription of the Avail Journal, which means you're going to get four amazing Avail Journals. Uh, do so at availjournal.com. Hey, Charles, this has been awesome. I, I could I wouldn't mind doing a few more programs. So you, you might, you might be getting a phone call later, but, uh, uh this, me is, up. <laughs> me up. this has been such a, such an insightful, uh, conversation. I think all leaders out there have been encouraged and blessed by it. If you can leave us with, with just, just the final thought from your heart to our leaders, what are some closing comments, final thought you want to leave us with? You know, the final thing that I would say, it, it, it's, the, it's the big idea on my mind. You've got to know what season you're in. You've got to know what season you're in. And when you know what season you're in, you know, you, you know what is and you know what isn't. You know, when you, when you know you're in a running season, mm-hmm. what is there to complain about? You know, yeah. you, it's busy. You, you got people <laughs> coming at you, you got things coming at you. And so, you know, I just want to encourage you to embrace whatever season that is that God's got you in, know that God's got grace for that, whatever that looks like. Um, sometimes they're tough seasons, and I talk about that in the book, and, and God's got grace to sustain you. And, and when you're in a tough season, for whoever this is for, sometimes the testimony is that you survived. Every single season you won't thrive, but sometimes just making it out of the ring alive. You walked out of the <laughs> ring. <laughs> that is the blessing. And, and so embracing all of those. And I can't wait to connect. Um, the book is available. Classes are available. All at charlesjenkins.com. Love it. Everybody, keep your eyes peeled. Keep your ears open for Charles Jenkins' book, which is coming out, Seasons, How to Grow and Succeed During Times of transition. I think that was a great final word. We got to know what season we're in. Uh, Charles, on behalf of the entire Avail leadership team and myself, uh, we are blessed to have you and we honor you. Thank you for your leadership, for your courage. Thank you for taking uh, steps uh, that maybe a lot of people never took in the position that you were in. And uh, thank you for leading boldly. And thank you for writing these books that are just equipping and helping so many leaders. We, we, we're really thankful for your life and we bless you, brother. 
Thank you, bro. I appreciate that so much. I'm sending those blessings right back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm receiving them. So too. Hey, hey, everybody on the Avail Leadership Podcast listening in or watching right now, we're so thankful for your audience. The fact that you're listening, that you're uh, watching, that you're connecting with us means a lot to us. We want to make sure we're giving you uh, leadership content that is that is of value, that is practical, that is relevant for you, just like this conversation with Charles Jenkins. So thanks for being with us. And we hope to see you next time here on the Avail Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us for week two of our Back to Leadership series here on the Avail Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this flashback featuring Charles Jenkins. Remember, you can connect with Charles by going to charlesjenkins.com. And you can find more leadership resources by visiting us at theartofleadership.com. Make sure to claim your free annual subscription of the Avail Journal by going to availjournal.com. And if you'd like to connect to our growing leadership community on Facebook, visit availleadershipconnect.com. As always, I'm your Avail Media host, Virgil Sierra. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for connecting with us to learn the art of leadership here at the Avail Podcast.